Okay, let's talk about this world <coughs> of artist websites. First of all, you have to have a website. We were just talking two minutes ago, <coughs> Judy, who's sitting here next to me, about how neither of us has touched our website for a couple months. Okay, that sounds really irresponsible, and it probably is, but you know something? Now that she and I have our websites up, you don't have to work on it every day. Whereas by comparison, just a quick thought about social media, social media is something that I do every day. So the thing about a website is yes, it's very time consuming, and yes, it will take you a while to get all the information and stuff put together, but once you have something that looks pretty basic and decent, it's not really something you have to spend a huge amount of time on. And really the only time that I go and I do a major update on my website is if I have a new body of work that I want to present, if I win an artist fellowship and I want to put it on my CV and my website, a major update like that. But day to day I don't really work on my website very much. So it is something you have to dedicate a lot of time to, but once it's there, it's there for a little while and as long as you make sure it's in pretty good shape, it's really something that can sort of take care of itself. I mean, you don't want to let it sit for too long. Obviously, if a few years passes by, that's going to get very embarrassing, but a couple months, Judy, you won't tell me about it, right? Okay, so first thing to talk about is the domain name. Now, the domain name seems like such a simple thing, but I'm constantly amazed that it's something people don't think about in advance. And I would say if after the lecture you start to feel that your domain name isn't really fulfilling your needs, you may really want to consider changing it. And it's better to change it earlier on than later. It's like if you have only 100 Instagram followers and you change your Instagram handle, it doesn't really matter that much. But if you have like 20,000, it does sort of matter. Same thing with a website. If you have only had your website up for a little while, you want to change your domain name, that's really not a big deal at all. Now, the most important thing about a domain name is that it has to be short has to be easy to remember. For most people, the easiest way to do it is to use your name. So I lucked out. My name is Clara Lou, mm -hmm. so did Casey Runin, so did Lauren Welch, so they had no problem. That was a really easy thing to do. But what if your name is Jared, I can't even pronounce his last name. I've known him for so long, I still don't know how to pronounce it. Jared Krasoska. What if your name is Iska Greenfield Sanders? Then you're in big trouble because, God, who knows how to spell this correctly. Second of all, the likeliness of a typo in a name this long is so incredibly high. So I always admired that Jarrett was so smart in the beginning of his career, and his website is Studio JJK. And so now, whenever I think, oh, I want to visit Jarrett's website, I don't think, Jarrett K, Jarrett K, 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 I just think, oh, Studio JJK, no problem. I just remember his initials. Really easy. Iska did Iska GS. Instead of Greenfield Sanders, which is a mouthful, she just did GS. So it really depends on your artwork. Some people will do like, like for example, photography JJK or painting JJK. You know, you can do variations on that. Studio is sort of nice because for some people, you might end up changing your studio practice. I'll tell you guys, when I was in art school, I thought I was an oil painter, and so I had painting over all of my stuff. I haven't used a paintbrush in 15 years. And so those domain names that I had from like way, way back, they don't work for me anymore. And so I actually think that it's better to have something more generic, like studio or like artist or art or something like that. Unless you, you really are so certain that you're not gonna all of a sudden become um, an encaustic painter after being a photographer for 50 years. You know, I mean, maybe there are exceptions to that world, but this is really important to remember, is the domain name and how critical that becomes. And guys, it's really worth it to buy one. I know it's so tempting to say, oh, I don't need to get it, I don't want to pay the extra fee, but look at the difference between claralou.com and claralou.squarespace.com. I mean, it's so much to deal with at the bottom. So. There are some things that I think are not worth paying for in terms of online services. This is the one you really should pay for, okay? So if you're gonna dish out for anything, dish out for the domain name because this is really, really worth it. The next thing about your website is you need to show that your site is active. And what we mean by active is that it's been looked at over the past year or so. 
it's a totally different time frame than social media. So for example, if you're on Instagram and you haven't posted in a month, I would say that's too long to go without posting. On a website, that's okay, one month is fine. I would say once you get beyond a year and if you have something that says like July 2015, that gets to be a little bit embarrassing, so you don't want anything like that. I think six months is a pretty good period. Unless you've posted something about a big show and it's been over for four months, like that you want to get rid of. But other stuff like artwork and your CV and all that stuff, the exhibition listings, those are all totally fine. There's a couple of things you really want to avoid, and I see this all the time on artist websites. You'll get stuff like this where you click on somebody's website and this will pop up, blog not found. Sorry, the blog you're looking for does not exist. So if you have dead links on your site, if you have, for example, a YouTube video that at one point was live, then got deleted, and now all of a sudden somebody goes to your website, there's supposed to be a video there, but this posts up because the video got deleted, because it's too old, or because it just didn't get used at a certain point. So it's really important, even if you've been working with your website for a while, just every now and then like double check some of the links, especially the external links because those are the ones that you don't have any uh, power over. Your links you can control, but if Arlington Center for the Arts changes their website to something else and you end up with those like, sorry, not found, that's not good. So you really want to double check and make sure that all of those external sites are active. A really good way to do it with very little effort is to put your news on your homepage because <clears throat> the inside of your website doesn't really have to change in terms of timing, but the home page you can fix really fast. Usually it's one image, a little text, boom, you're done. And so the nice thing about the home page, that's the first thing that anybody's gonna see when they go to your website. They have no choice, they have to see this page. There are other parts of your website which somebody visiting may not ever see because maybe they're looking at another page and they're not interested in that section. This is the only place where you can guarantee people will definitely see it. So for example, if you have a solo show, let's say you have a solo show coming up in December, okay? You can write, for example, here, Society of Arts and Crafts, December 2018, exhibition, Boston, Massachusetts. And so that way, somebody who comes here says, oh, she's got a show coming up in December, and then immediately your first thought is, this website has been updated, okay? And maybe you put that update on three months ago because you had that show come up way, way, way before, you already have it up on your website, it makes your website look nice and alive for a good couple of months. So this is important to understand, is that the time frame between social media and websites, totally different. Instagram, I feel like it's like by the day. I feel like websites, it's like a couple of months at a time. So that's important to understand that difference. The whole thing about an artist's website, less is more. Oh my god, if I could say this to everybody 5,000 times a day, it would not be enough. Because the temptation to want to put everything you've ever done in your entire artistic career on your website is so incredibly high. And it's like that for everybody. To want to put down every show you've been in, every single publication, every person you've interacted with. That does not necessarily come across well, and so you have to be very picky about what you select, how you present yourself on your website. I cannot tell you how many websites I've seen with this exact greeting on the homepage. Hello, welcome to my website. Feel free to look around, contact me for any inquiries, inquire about any sales or commissions you'd like me to do. Thanks for stopping by. Yes, that's very friendly, okay? Yes, I know your heart is in the right place, but you know something? This is clutter. Okay? If somebody really wants to buy something off your website, it's not going to be because they read the sentence. It's going to be because something really drew them in, and if they want to buy something, they will find you. Trust me, they will hunt down your email. It will take about two seconds for that to happen. So really try to avoid these like big greeting sentences. Don't put them on your about page, not on your CV, nowhere. Okay? Not necessary. Look at the difference between the top bar and the bottom bar. To read Casey's resume, click here. Oh my goodness, if I had a dollar for every single website that said click here, 
I could send my kids to college like eight times, but it's not necessary. Why would you write out all of those words and type out click here when you could just embed the link in the resume in the word resume? You've cut back five times on the quantity. So not only is it an issue of things being usable and being efficient, but just visually, you don't want to clutter your website with just so much stuff that's not necessary that people don't get to the point quickly. My recommendation for fonts is keep them really plain. Unless you are a calligrapher or you specialize in illuminated manuscripts and topography is somehow embedded in your work, if you're a graphic designer that specializes in designing fonts, fine, eat your heart out. But for the rest of us, plain, okay? I know some of these fonts are really cool and really fun looking, but not for your website, okay? Look at the difference <clears throat> between how you look at my name here, here, and here. This is the font that I use. If you're wondering, it's Futura um, Black, and so Futura Book, rather. And so I use this across all of my websites. This is just another one. If you look at this, you think, oh, Clara likes the ancient Roman Empire, mm -hmm. I guess. Down here, you look at it, you think, okay, Roaring Twenties, Clara Lou. Yeah, <laughs> I got it. You don't want to have those sort of silly associations because it just distracts. If you just have plain font, just Clara Lou. That's it, okay? Look at the difference. This is one of my students at RISD. It was a course based on all of this professional development information. And she had so many weird fonts. Like, first of all, she had this like gothic calligraphy font in the upper left-hand corner. And I'm like, Katrina, your work has nothing to do with the Middle Ages in Europe, okay? This is not relevant. And then little things like the paragraph down in the bottom, which is done entirely in caps, is also very distracting. So what you want to do with text, just strip it down, okay? Your work is not about topography, unless it is, which for most people it is not, <laughs> because it's very specialized. But um, you really want people looking at the artwork. You don't want them like fawning over the font, okay? You want them thinking about the images. Let's talk about the artist resume, always a landmine of problems. The biggest suggestion I have to you guys is don't pad. Don't do it. I know it's so tempting, and I know sometimes pe people feel, oh, the more the better. The longer the CV, the better. Mm -mm. Not true. I can tell you guys that any time I'm looking at an artist's resume, I can tell in about three seconds if they're padding, and it always comes across as just so achingly desperate. Just don't do it. I'd so much rather see an artist's resume that's one page that has very high quality, um, very uh, well-invested um, interests or initiatives than one that's like 15 pages long where every other exhibition is Cambridge Art Association member shows 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, 30, 31. I, I've seen it, I really have seen it. So you select your exhibitions and you avoid repetition, okay? I have been in the RISD faculty biennial every other year since 2007, okay? I think it's on my CV one time. In fact, I think it might not even be there anymore because it's like, hmm, she's at RISD. I think she's going to be in the RISD faculty biennial. I think that's sort of the, you know, sort of a given. So you don't really need to do that. So look at how silly this looks. <laughs> From my point of view, if I look at this and I think, okay, 25th members exhibition, 24th, 23rd, 22nd, okay. <laughs> faculty show, all right, pray making now, that sounds sort of interesting, but the thing is, what I've seen first is 23, 24, 25. I haven't gone on to printmaking now, which might actually be, out of all of these shows, the more prestigious, more better known exhibition. So if you maybe have members exhibition once, and then put in printmaking now, it looks better. And so this does not make you look better, just because you have more letters on the paper does not necessarily make you look like a more accomplished artist. If you don't have it, don't include it. I know a lot of people will look at other artists' resumes and go, oh, well, they have a collection section. Oh, well, they have commissions. Oh, they've got um, artist fellowships and residencies. They've got all these areas, lectures and stuff like that. If you have never lectured, don't put it down. If you have never done an artist residency, don't put it down, and there is no shame in that. I did my first artist residency two summers ago, 
okay? I've been working professionally for over two decades now, and I don't care. It's, it's like, okay, well, I've got other sections that are more prominent, and that's fine. So don't feel that you need to check off every single category in your artist's resume. Collections, this is probably the, the worst area of people padding. Uh, take a look at this. In my collections, Sarah Lou and Sarah Lou <laughs> own my artwork. Wow, is, oh, no coincidence that they have the same last name. Cafe Harmony, okay. Terry Richards, who's that? The Village Bank, okay, I guess it's a bank. This is not collections, you guys, okay? <laughs> if you put your collections together and this is what it looks like, don't put it on, okay? Just don't. It, this, this is so embarrassing and it just drives me crazy anytime I see this on an artist's resume. Anybody who's reviewing you for an exhibition, for inclusion in a show, for um, anything, any artist opportunity can spot this a mile away because they've seen it 10,000 times. So don't think you're gonna be that one artist who tricks that gallery director, because you're not. Mm -hmm. They've seen it so many times over. This is a real collections listing. Museum of Fine Arts Boston, Boston Public Library, some name like David Mugar, who is well known enough that people know that he is a collector, or the David and Barbara Stahl collection. Now, this is not a well-known name. You can't look at David and Barbara Stahl and go, oh, that's like David Mugar. So the way you can make this a little bit more legitimate is if you link it to their collection. So this is a print collection that I actually am in. And like I said, they're not famous like David Mugar are, but they did have a show at the Courier Museum several years ago. So what you can do is link to that exhibition. So if somebody says, hmm, Who's David and Barbara Stahl? Oh, click. Oh, they had a show at the Currings. Okay, that's legitimate. That's a very quick way to get people to understand who these people are without having to do a lot of explaining. Okay, exhibitions. Always a big mess that you guys need to clean up and organize. Now, look at the difference between the top bar and the bottom bar. They both have the exact same three exhibitions listed, and they both communicate, for the most part, the same information. But note what is missing in the lower section. So up here, I've written September, July, and March. That's not down here. Who cares? Oh, September, I've got to book this artist now. They didn't show in October. I've got to book them. It was in September. Who cares? It doesn't matter, OK? Look up here. Two-person invitational, site-specific, invitational. Okay, we know you got invited. It's an exhibition, okay? It's really obvious when it's a juried show. Like anything that says members exhibition is pretty obvious that you got in there because you're a member or if it's 15th annual juried exhibition of blah, blah, blah. Most people can tell from the type of gallery, from the location, from the um, exhibition tile exactly what's going on. So you really don't need to write two-person invitational. You don't have to write site-specific. I mean, if it says France, and you're looking at an artist who lives in Cambridge, of course it's site-specific. I mean, duh. You don't need to add that extra information. Um, what really, really matters, you guys, title of the exhibition, the title of the venue, and absolutely the location. That really matters. So here we say, oh, wow, well, France, Vermont, Massachusetts. Anytime I skim an artist's resume, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for location and also the venue as well. You want to make sure that in your resume, and actually on your entire website, anytime there is any opportunity to link to any external website, you should. So for example, I don't live in Vermont. I don't know what Count Amount Arts really is. But maybe I want to look at this and go, hmm, is that legitimate or not? So if you link to Catamount Arts in your artist resume on your website, then people can click on it and boom, in one second they can say, oh, it's a nonprofit organization in Vermont that caters to artists. Leslie University, maybe you live in France and you don't know what Leslie University is. You click on it, okay, it's a liberal arts college in Boston. So linking is really great because it gets people to really understand the legitimacy of the places that you're showing in, and also it helps you with SEO. SEO represents search engine optimization. We could do 18 lectures on SEO, but the basic idea behind SEO is Google ranks websites according to relevance, okay? And so 
they decide that your website is more or less relevant depending on the content in the website. And the more external links you have, the higher your SEO has. So a website that has no external links at all, nothing, is not going to have very high SEO. If it's got links all over it, it's going to have much higher SEO. Not by a lot. I mean, I'm not saying you're going to jump to the top of the um, race, but it will put you there. And I do think that it is, I don't know, I, I think it's a nice thing just to do in the arts community. Like, I'm sure a lot of you guys are affiliated with like nonprofit arts organizations, and you know, they probably supported your show and you want to support them. It's just a nice thing to do in general, but it also helps that too. So it's, it's really a um, win win situation, in my opinion. Can you link to the school you went to? Yeah, that would be fine. Yeah. Anything that's like an institution or a profit, that type of thing. Um, and when you do an external link, make sure that it opens a new tab. So let me show you guys what I mean by that. So if I go, let's see, I'll just go on to one of these pages. So one thing you want to do on your website is you want to get people to stay on your website. So if they click on an external link, like for example, on my website, we have all these art supplies here. And these art supplies all link to Amazon because that way people can go buy um, the product and they know exactly what they need to get. Look at what happens when I click on India Inc. Does everybody see how that opened a new tab? Okay, some people forget to do that and what happens is they will click on India Inc. and it will not open a new tab and then you are out of your website. That person is on Amazon going, oh, I can buy Peeps for five cents April 30th and then they've totally forgotten about India Inc. Okay, so it depends on your serve your um, platform, but wherever it says open link in a new tab, check it off. That's very important for an external link because if you don't do that, people are going to leave your website in two seconds. Because now, if I do that, I can just it's just a click away to go back to my site, and then I'm not well. Maybe I am distracted by Amazon, but anyway, um, let's take a look. Okay. Let's talk about awards. This is again another area where people tend to get a little carried away with what they list. Now, there are so many different types of awards of different sizes and degrees and everything, and it does sort of depend on where you are. Like somebody who maybe just got out of school last spring, it probably would be okay for somebody like that to have a resume like this. But if you didn't just get out of school, you probably shouldn't be putting down honor roll mention. You should not be putting down honor roll. I mean, honestly, if you went to BU, all I care about is that you got the degree. I really don't care that you made the honor roll. Juror's commendation is sort of like honorable mention as well, not really that critical. And especially if you get a lot of these, again, it really looks like resume padding, so I really recommend against that. This is better, so if you have like a legitimate award, like lots of schools have awards they give to students, like you know, by an alumni or something, like Frank, sorry, can you turn that off? Yeah, if you just tap on the bottom. There you go. Or an artist grant, artist fellowship, Massachusetts Cultural Council, those are all the types of things. Is it not turning off? Okay, sorry about that. So these are all legitimate awards, and really, you guys, I'd much rather see no award category than one that's padded. I really would. And I know a lot of people are like, well, what? I really, I don't like, no. It's so much better just to be classy and just get rid of it. It's just not that important. What if you only have a couple? Go ahead. I'll, I'll answer just because you did it. <laughs> you only have a couple of awards. It's fine. I mean, Honestly, so the person that has 15, that doesn't impress me unless every single one is from like the Guggenheim or the MacArthur or something like that. So once I see honorable mention 15 times, I don't care. But if I see one and it's Massachusetts Cultural Council, I go, nice job. That's what I say. So does everybody see that one really good award is better than 15 the awards? Nobody really cares. It's not about quantity, you guys. It really is about quality, because I can spot that a mile away. And it just screams desperation from an artist's point of view. OK, so lectures. Obviously, not everybody lectures, but if you do, that is good to put down. Artist residencies as well. And again, a lot of this really depends on the type of artist you are. For some people, artist residencies just aren't applicable to the type of work they do. 
For some people, residencies are critical to the type of work that they do. So you shouldn't feel that there's this like checklist that you need to get everything because it's really specific to you and your own personal interests. Professional affiliations. I could not believe what my students put down <laughs> as a professional affiliation, and I'm not joking. So my RISD students apparently decided that being a RISD student gives you automatic RISD Museum of Art membership, that that was a professional affiliation. No, guys, that's not professional affiliation. If you pay for membership at the Decordova or the MFA, that is not a professional affiliation, okay? If you go to the Danforth Museum School and you take classes there, that is not a professional affiliation, okay? So you have to be very clear about what that is. And it is confusing because I know sometimes it's not really that obvious. It's something like this. For example, there's a lot of artist associations around here, like there's um, Monotype Guild in New England, there's the Boston Printmakers. If you are a board member of the South Shore Arts Center, that is a professional affiliation. And honestly, a lot of people don't have this section on their resume. A lot of people, it's just not applicable. So again, I really advise you guys, just don't put it down if it's not relevant. Okay, let's go down. Okay. Strange. Why did that? Okay. Oh, I'm back on Amazon again. Okay. Sorry about that. I think this. Oh, I guess this thing is not responding. Come on. Yeah, it's. Let's pause for a second while this thing updates. Who has questions at this point about resume stuff? While I wait for this to update. I do. I mean, I have it on my website, and it just looks so junky having it there, and I took it off. Do you think it's important to have all your exhibitions and? What looks junky having the CD? Yeah. Why do you think it looked junky? It just felt like too many words. Like nobody really wants to read all that stuff. People won't really read it, but I definitely will skim. Like when I was a gallery director a few years ago and I would review artist portfolios and stuff and I sort of want to get a sense of who they were, I would go right to the CV. Actually, most of the time, and we will get to this, I did not go to the about page because I stopped wanting to read, I'm an artist, I work, I'm thinking about stones and their relationship to the moon. I just didn't <laughs> want that. And so the CV to me was so much easier and faster because it was like cold, hard facts. Whereas like dreaming about the moon, I just don't care. So you may think it looks very, well, in your words, junky, but it's not. It's actually a factual timeline of your experience as an artist. It's just a tendency of people to really massively overdo it. Yeah. It's just so high, so it's a problem for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I'm an illustrator, and when I was going to school for that, and we were talking about websites, no one ever talked about having your CV. It was like the portfolio was the most important thing. Um, but uh -huh. do you think an illustrator should have a CV? I think an illustrator, it's, it's not so much a CV as much as it is a client list. So you probably could list all of your clients um, and then you probably would want to list like your education. If, uh, actually, illustration has lots of awards, um, like all those conferences or if you present or something like that. It's just the categories are a little bit different. But again, it's a similar thing where I don't want to read your fluffy, well hopefully you don't have a fluffy about page. I just want to go see who have you illustrated for. So I think that is very important as an illustrator because if you don't have a client list, who are you as an illustrator? I have no idea. So it is very important. Other questions? I'll take one more before we start up. Um, I don't have any of the above. I'm totally self-trained amateur. Mm -hmm. But I did include something that said, well, I'm a jazz musician and I improvise and I improvise in my art and that's what you might see there. Mm -hmm. that, okay? that is more information for your artist statement. So you can talk about how improvisation and your experience um, really influences your artwork, but it doesn't belong in your CV and it doesn't belong in your out about page unless it's like half a sentence, which we will get to. So one of the things that's very tricky about artist websites is how to know where to put what. That's what gets confusing because depending on the artwork you have, you may feel that, oh, well, this really should go in the About page, but I'm telling you, no, don't put it there. I'm not going to look for it there. So that's what gets very confusing. So we'll go over that. All right, looks like we're back online. Education. So look at, again, the difference between 
this page, GPA 3.9 on a roll. Not just on a roll, mind you, four years in a row, semester abroad, summa cum laude. Really, all I care about is that you got the degree and you went on the European Honors Program and you graduated in 2002. And really, we're all looking at the date because we want to know how old you are. I mean, I hate to say it, but it's true. I, especially when you're looking at artists and you're hiring people and stuff like that, I go to that date for that particular reason. Um, so anyway, look at the difference. I mean, down your honor roll, thesis, yes, of course you had a thesis exhibition. It's an MFA degree. You've got to have that. So you don't need to do that. 2004, MFA in painting, BU, story is over. Okay. Contact. This is probably one of the most important pages on your website. Do not mess it up because it will make a break. The difference between somebody contacting you to buy something or not. Because if something is too difficult to do, have you ever given up on a website where you couldn't find something and you're like, oh, screw this? That's going to happen on your website if you don't do a good job on this page. So you will see this all the time. Thanks for stopping by. Email me if you want to chat. Check out my sketches. I see this so much. Oh my goodness. Even this is still not good enough for a couple of reasons. Does everybody see how Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram just blur together into a bunch of text? This is just begging to be spammed because what spam things do is they go out and they try to find email addresses and they will pick this up in about two seconds. So what you want to do instead <coughs> is have this. So you'll notice oftentimes on websites, people will write Clara parentheses at claralu.com. So for example, this will not get picked up as an email because they can't just recognize the at claralu.com, which is what a bot would do for spam. So it keeps you out of the spam areas. And also look at how different the icons look compared to this. I mean, don't these just look yummy? I mean, everybody likes colors, everybody likes shapes. This is so cold. And I think now, with social media being so prominent, people look for these icons. And whenever I see just Facebook typed out as text, I just don't recognize it remotely as quickly. So make sure your contact page is really, really clear cut. And honestly, you don't need more than that on your contact page. And some of you will say to me, you look so empty. Have a picture, OK? I'll show it to you guys on my website. I just have this information, picture, that's it. That's all I have for my contact page. There's no distractions. There's nothing that could make it difficult for you to find exactly what you need. OK, your About page is very important not as important in terms of communicating information, but in terms of establishing the tone for your website, like what kind of personality or character you want to communicate in your website. And that's why the About page is one of the most difficult pages to write, because it's not hard and factual. It is a little bit more difficult to do. I think it's very important to show your face. I think 20 years ago, people didn't care that much about seeing the artist's face. But it seems like now, if you don't have your face on your website or on your Instagram or wherever, it's a big turnoff. Like, it makes people look at you and think, OK, it's some artist. People want to know who is the artist. What do they look like? So don't be shy. Show your face. If you really are feeling self-conscious about it, just have like one picture. You don't have to have like a big mosaic gallery. I mean, some people do. But it should be a nice photo. It doesn't have to be one like this. Like this is a very like headshot photo, OK? And if you don't have the equipment to get a nice pro shot like this, you can do something like this. Have one of your friends take a photo of you working in the studio. So you don't have to like look at the camera. You can like look at your painting. And you can be with your supplies and in your studio. Some people feel a lot more comfortable with a photo like this. So you can do something like that. And sometimes it's a little bit better, but I really, really encourage you guys to show your face. I know so many people are nervous about that, but I know that I always connect better with a website when I see the face of the person. And I don't know what it is, but it seems like it's real. Like, you ever go to a website and you're like, oh, there's this cool artwork by some person named Katrina Pissetti, okay? But then you see the face, and it's like you understand something about them right away. So that's my recommendation. Now, look at the difference between this statement and the statement I'm going to show you after this. Basically, your About page is a written narrative of who you are, summing up who you are as a person. So here is where you may put in something 
about your past experience that maybe is not art related. Like um, I worked with somebody who used to be a chemist and they talked about how chemistry really influenced the work that they were doing later on. And I thought that was really interesting. So instead of just saying, I, um, I'm a printmaker, you can say, I'm a former chemist turned printmaker. Like, this is a good place to put that. Like, for example, Judy, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but you used to be a physics professor. And so that's great to put in your about page to say, I was a physics professor for many years. I am now a photographer. Now, in your CV, we don't want to see where you published in all those physics journals. It's just not relevant. So you can certainly put that, OK, you have these physics degrees, but that's where the physics is going to end in terms I'll of your CV. To my other yeah, you can do that too. And that's a quicker way, because then people, if they want to know, then they can actually go. But I get a lot of questions about that, because there's a lot of artists I know who did not start as artists. They did something else. But they don't want to make it all about that thing. But this is one way to sort of sneak it in. Now, in my statement, I keep it very factual because I don't tend to get all personal and friendly in terms of my website stuff. I like to keep it a little bit more professional. That's a sense of personal taste. That's my recommendation. So I'm very um, factual. I'm an adjunct professor at RISD, partner at Art Prof, studio practice, drawing, printmaking, sculpture, and then I talk about human emotion, human figures, and faces. So if you want to sum me up as a person, that's what it is. It's, it's the most distilled version of who you are. Look at the difference between that and this. Hey guys, I teach at RISD. I also made this website. You can learn about art. Oh, I love reading and hugging my guinea pig bubba. <laughs> it, you, you can be this person. If you want to be this person, eat your heart out. But take a wild guess how differently people react from this statement to this statement. Okay, so write out different versions and see which one you're comfortable with. I do think there is a happy medium between this one and this one. Sometimes people start professional and they add a little quirk here and there and they end in something about a guinea pig, but I don't like sharing that part of my life with people, so I don't put it into my website, but some people do. It's, it's all a matter of personal taste, but I think if you're not sure or if you're uncomfortable, just err on the professional side because my goodness, can you mess up the guinea pig thing if you do it wrong? So, okay. My biggest advice for photos on your website is that artists live and die by their photographs. Sounds very dramatic, but guess what, guys? It's true. I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, people are going to see your artwork on the screen before they will see it in person. In fact, it's going to be rare that somebody will see your work in person. And that means you have to put so much time and effort into making amazing photographs that really accurately represent the experience of your artwork. Little things can totally mess up a photo. I mean, these two photos are almost the same. But look at this idiotic mistake. It's like, really, you couldn't move the camera just a little bit higher? I mean, it's like that's the difference between this and this. This is a gray background. This is a black background. Look at how much better the gray looks. This is too stark. This is like black and white. It's like really hard to see the form. Here you have the gray, and so the shadows are more prominent, and they're a little bit softer, a little easier to read. Stuff like cropping it. I see this all the time on student websites. Like on the left-hand side, could not be bothered to crop things out. I mean, that's when I pull out the, well, in the olden days, we had slides, and we couldn't do Photoshop. And, I mean, it's incredible what you can do today with so little effort and so little money compared to what we used to have to do a long time ago. Works in progress really belong on social media. So images like this, which are great to have you being in the studio, being a total slob with your art supplies, which for some people is very endearing, um, you should take those photos, but put them on Instagram, put them on Facebook, don't put them on your website, okay? Website is like a museum retrospective of you. Okay, you wouldn't have like, you know, stacks of newspaper and crap all over the floor in a museum retrospective. Same thing with your website. You just don't want to put that mess there. And yes, you do need to be on social media. So if that's that little thing that you've been putting off for a while, get started because sooner rather than later. Let's talk about the work. So it's very important on a website to categorize your artwork because most people have multiple bodies of work or they have work that was from many years ago that's not related to what they're doing now. So you have to have categories. 
Now these categories are complicated though because sometimes you have too many categories. Like these are all areas that I work in myself, but I don't post all of these categories because it's so confusing. It's like, oh, well they paint, they do digital design, illustration, residence, works out. Like, who is this person? Like you end up looking like this terrible patchwork quilt of artwork, which doesn't look so good. And now this is better because there's only three categories, but look at the categories. Architecture, illustration, graphic design. Like really? Like what are you a sophomore taking three electives this semester? I mean, it doesn't work that way if you're presenting yourself as a professional artist. This is a much better grouping because these are all in the fine arts. Drawings, paintings, sculpture. So they're distinctive from each other, but they do seem related. You can also do it like this. Instead of grouping it by media, you can group it by the subject. So for example, these are four bodies of work that I've done over the past few years. And so each body of work has multiple media, but I group it this way because it makes more sense. Because if I did it by media, I'd have 30 categories. It would be too much. So this is, again, where it really depends on how you work. People work in many different ways. You want to curate. Uh, when you do your images, this is the one technical thing I can tell you guys about because, wow, we could do a whole other thing about how to actually make the website. But this is the one that most people never get told for some reason, but actually is so important. When you upload an image to your website, you have to compress it. Don't just take the JPEG and then just put it in your website, okay? Because you would have an image which is gigantic. And if you don't compress it, it's going to take up so much space in your website. And number two, it's going to take forever to load. It's going to take so long to load that people will leave. I think I've read somewhere some statistic that when Walmart uh, decreased their load time by one second, they retained like 30% more people because of that one second, okay? So you need to compress your images, number one, so they're a lot smaller. And then you need to use this function in Photoshop, which is called Save for Web. So that compresses the images for the purpose of putting them onto a website. So if you have never compressed your images, you better get to work because this is going to kill your website in terms of storage and in terms of having a really, really long load time. I made the mistake so many times. So um, as somebody who really <coughs> suffered and paid for that, I'm warning you right now. There are, there are apps for that. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of ways to do it on a bulk basis so you don't do it one by one. So research that. What, what's the proper file size? Um, it really depends. I mean, I always do 1366 pixels. Why? Because that's the laptop resolution. And then I do save for web. And then if it's a vertical, I do 786 pixels. But I would really do your research, you guys. Don't take it from me necessarily because I'm not a web developer. And, and DPI 72? DPI 72 generally seems to be okay for web. I mean, for web, most people are looking on a phone. And so, like, this is the biggest you're ever going to get. You're really not going to be projecting, like, on a giant movie theater screen. So it shouldn't be a big problem. But you can, you can expand it so you see small areas if you really want to see. Yeah, I mean, you certainly image. could have the full image and then offer, like, a detail of this and a detail mm -hmm. of that. So there's ways around it so that way you don't have to, like, always make everything so small. But let me tell you, people have such a short attention span. <laughs> it may not even be worth it. Okay, one thing you guys want to really avoid on the website is scrolling. People hate scrolling. My God, you think you ask them to like clean their room. It's just, <laughs> oh my God, so horrible scrolling. So one thing that's very good to have when you have your artwork, do thumbnails. Do like a grid, something like this, where you can go into the images and then you can click on them. So let me give you an example because um, Liz has it on her art art page. I think it's LizShepard.com. Here we go. Okay, so if you go to Liz's, and Liz is somebody who I've worked with, so I've done lots of consulting with her on her website. So Liz has this grid, and if you click on the grid, it pulls in a much bigger image. You can scroll through, or you can close, and then go back. And so what this means is you don't have to like do this forever, because what I see a lot of artists do is instead of having this grid, they'll just stack images like that. And so you end up going like this forever and ever and ever. If you look at Liz's, because she has a grid, that's all I have to do to look at like 30 images. Very fast and very easy to access. 
So definitely make sure that you guys um, go for that format because the scrolling thing, just from usability testing and watching people do websites, it's incredible how quickly annoyed people are when they have to scroll through anything. Can we pass the question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in the grid, mm -hmm. when you clicked on that one image and then there were arrows on either side, did that go to other images that aren't in the grid or that, that, did that go it's to the rest of the grid? It's only images in the grid. In the grid. Yep, in that order. So for example, if you click on this one yeah. and you click to the right, it'll take you to that one. Oh, okay. It'll take you to that one, that one, that Not one. Not to one. other ones in the series of the shoe. No, well, it depends on, that's the way Liz's website okay. is set up. There may be other people where they do it by body of work, okay. but in Liz's, she has it formatted like that. Okay, so let's talk about the artist statement. Everybody's favorite place because we all became artists and we can write <laughs> verbally about our artistic intentions. Okay, the artist statement, my advice is if you do not feel that you are a strong writer, I do not feel that I'm a fantastic writer, especially for stuff like this, hire an editor. Honestly, if it's just like a two paragraph thing, it shouldn't cost you a huge amount or if you have a friend that's an editor, that really helps as well. But it really, really helps to have a good, succinct artist statement that actually makes sense. Unlike this one, with a particular focus in different performative modes of art making, her work is an attempt to promote bodily interspecies, intercultural to encounters and explore the effects and effects of different courses in techno science. I cut and paste this off of one of my colleagues' websites. <laughs> I will not tell you who it is. This is better. Ayame's pieces are made with pinch and coil techniques to give an organic, wabi-sabi feel to her work. The slow process of hand-building ceramics allows Ayame to focus on subtle detail and give time and intention into each piece. A couple really good things in her statement. We understand, number one, that she's a ceramicist. I haven't even shown you anything about her artwork, and we know she works in ceramics. We know her work is organic. We know her work is pinch and coil techniques. So we know the material, we know a little bit about the technique, and we know about organic, and if you know what wabi-sabi is, I'm not gonna be the person to describe that, but it's a um, <coughs> aesthetic in, in Japanese culture about, I, I think it's about simplicity, and I, anyway, I'll let somebody else who's more articulate describe that. But um, you know immediately a little bit about her work, not everything, but enough to sort of entice you. Okay, next thing. Menu bar, oh my goodness, if I could redo everybody's menu bar, I'd be one busy web developer. <laughs> so the menu bar is very important because it's what people refer to when they are navigating through your website. So the menu bar above is a real problem because there's a lot of extra stuff in there that's just not relevant. So for example, in this menu bar, they've written info, and they've written portfolio. Neither of these is linked on this person's website, so why have it? Like, why do you have extra words on your menu bar that are not linked? Of course it's info, we know it's info. Portfolio, yes, duh, we know it's a portfolio. You don't need to have it. Drawings, animal drawings, paintings, bio-in statement, resume, it's just so busy, look at this. Name, video, photo, news, about. That's a good menu bar. It's incredible how hard it is to organize your website to the point to have that simple of a menu bar. I'm in awe of people that have so few pieces on their menu bar and don't cut back on their content. And so this is where you guys just need to sit down and just draw like charts and figure out, okay, what's in my website? How do I organize it? What goes where? And ultimately it all falls back onto your menu bar. I look at the menu bar above, I don't know where to start. I'm just going, oh my gosh. Usually when I go to an artist's website, the first thing I click on is about. So I like that to be very clear. Actually, she really should have a contact like on her menu bar. I gotta give Lana a call. But uh, contact should definitely be there. Okay, so you also need to edit. You need to make sure that there are no typos, that there are no misspellings. Um, I know that sounds very cosmetic, but that is again where people get judgmental and they go, oh, they couldn't be bothered to spell check everything on their website. And again, I'm gonna remind you, less is more on the website. And that is not the case on social media. Social media is a different beast. Social media, sometimes more is better. Not in the case of a website. So let me show you the difference between this first impression and this first impression. 
Okay, so this is um, a colleague that I had in New York City, and if you look at this, it's like, who is it? Some person who sculpts a figure. Okay, how long did it take you guys to find about Saban Howard? On his front page, you don't know what his name is until you go all the way down here. And then there's this awful, like, what is this thumbnail thing and the random video and this horrible, oh, I could go on and on, oh my god. Look at this. Clean, easy to read, nice font, Nita Miller, printmaker and visual artist, prints, other work, CV, about, contact, one nice, clean image. This is a good impression. People will leave a website so fast, you would not believe some of the behavior I have seen <laughs> and usability testing, it's incredible. So speaking of usability testing, this is something I really advise you guys all try at some point with a minimum of two people. You can't do it with only one person because you won't get a broad enough idea. But basically what usability testing is, is let's say you get your website to a point where there's enough to talk about. So let's say, um, I made my website and Judy is going to be my tester. Okay, so I say, okay, Judy, I want you to sit down. I want you to look at my website. I want you to just click through it, okay? But the difference in usability testing is I'm going to say, Judy, talk to me out loud exactly what's going through your head as you look at that website. Unfiltered. Tell me exactly what you think. So I'm going to show you guys. Let's go to Saban Howard's and uh, Actually, I'll go to Lana's because um, hers looks pretty good, and um, I think I could probably be a little bit more objective on her. Okay, to see the way people behave on a website. I mean, I would make things on my website and think, oh yeah, I'm getting the results. Then people would be like, what? Why? And I'd be like, why didn't you click on that? You were supposed to click on that. Oh, that was a button? I'm like, yes! <laughs> like, so do usability testing with at least two different people, and it's better if you do it with somebody who's not an artist. If you do it with somebody who is an artist, they're looking at your site with a different eye. So if you ask somebody like, for me, my tester is my sister because she works at a software company, doesn't know anything about art. And so she is like, if, if my site passes with her, I am good to go. So just think about that when you pick somebody. Like, don't just pick somebody because um, you think that they're just gonna tell you you're great. You know, get somebody who really is gonna give you actual feedback that you can use. Okay. So, we've got a couple websites to look at. So, Mark, why don't you start uh, telling us a little bit about your website? Sure, I just... Uh, I'm gonna click through as you talk. Yeah, sure, I, I just worked on this um, recently. I wanted to keep it, uh, I like to do acrylic painting, uh, abstract acrylic painting. Um, so, I uh, put together something I thought was, wanted to be pretty, pretty simple with examples of work. Um, so you could see the sizes, uh, prices, and then I wanted to show some examples of work on exhibit that I've done. And uh, so, and I have some <coughs> exhibits, so I put three different exhibits. I just listed some stuff that I've done recently. Um, and then uh, contact, uh, that's my artist statement. Mm -hmm. So would you say your website is in progress or? In pro I, yes, in progress. Yeah, okay, I, mean, I just I just um, have been working on it the past few weeks. Um, mm -hmm. Get something out there. So. Great. Contact so information. You know. I do want to bring up this contact yeah. form yeah. because a lot of people do use these contact forms, and people have different opinions on them. My feeling is that number one, I can tell you, I have never filled one of these forms out ever. I have never done it because for some reason. There's something that feels very anonymous about it. It makes me feel like I'm not contacting a person, that I'm just sending out something into the universe. Whereas if I go up here, you do list your email. I'd so much rather send you an email than fill out that contact okay. form. So I think if you do have the contact form, it would be a good idea to have the option of your email if you really feel strongly about that. But then to me, it's like if you have the email there, then why do you need a contact form? So you guys can, um, make that call. I don't think it's important to have your phone number here. I mean, if some of you really think it is, I just feel like for me, I'm a little bit more private and don't really want the option of people calling me when I don't want them to call me. So I might remove that, but that's again, that's a personal decision. That's up to you what you want to do. Um, the first thing I notice about your website is I don't see any image when I get to your website. I just see a statement. 
And so there's no like first impression because there's no image. There's no image until we scroll down. Now, you are not guaranteed that everybody will scroll down. Yeah. Some people might come here and go, oh, okay, let's go to artwork. And yeah, that does get you to the artwork, but wouldn't it be nice if just, boom, right off the bat, they saw your artwork on that first page. So I think that this statement could go and about. You could put it into um, an artist statement section, you could work it into your about page, but it should not be on your front page because that's not what your site is about. Your site's about your artwork. And that should be first and foremost, the very first thing that people see on the website. Um, I would also say when we look at the artwork, a lot of scrolling here. You can't click on each image. You can, yeah, but the thing yeah. is, when I see someone's yeah. artwork, usually I want the overview first, and then I go back in. And so for me to do that, I have to do a lot of this. So I think if you could do a grid that has a minimum three squares across, <coughs> that will just like half the scrolling by quite a bit. Um, I think, in my opinion, people have mixed opinions about this, but some people put prices and some people don't. My feeling is that it's not a good idea to have a price there unless you make it possible for them to actually buy it, because online shopping is so big now. Um, so if you have $450 and there's like a buy now button and we can click and buy it right away, that makes sense to me. But if your website really is just a gallery, and the intent is not to sell, then I would not put the price there. Because then I get, ooh, 450, why 450? I don't really look at the artwork so much. Maybe that's because I'm an artist and because I think about those things. But I just know that for a lot of people, the price has such a weight to it that I'd rather somebody just look at the artwork and not care about price. And then if they want to buy it, they can do something else. Like some people, what they do, I'll just show you guys my website really fast. Um, I do have an Etsy shop, but I don't list prices on my website. You have to actually click onto my shop because I find that when people are looking at artwork, that's a different thing than when they're shopping. Like sometimes I'll look at an artist's website and I, I want to like see what their work is and everything and I just don't want to be bothered by the prices and the shipping and everything like that. And I find with yours right now, let's go back, oh, oh, why is that not loading? That's strange. Okay. Wi-Fi is a little bit funkier. Okay, so here, I would take all of this text, make it really small, okay? It's huge, like look at this gigantic title. You wanna have it so that the image takes up the whole space and the text is very minimal, that it's just a cosmetic little thing, it's an accessory to the image. Right now, the way it's structured, the text and the image almost are like partners, they're like side by side, but they shouldn't be that way. Okay. Um, let's go back up, let's see, exhibits. Okay, recent exhibits. Okay, you don't have any links here, so you need to link all that stuff. Um, and I would say for exhibits, you probably only need to list about four, like the most recent four, because once I see that there's more than three or four, I stop looking at it, it's just too many to look at. Um, and then, let's see, the about page. Okay, it would be nice to have like more of an artist photo, like you with your paintbrushes, you in the studio, because um, I see the artwork, but I don't get a good sense of what your process is. Like, I don't know if you're a painter, I don't know if you're a um, watercolorist or something like that. Mm -hmm. So maybe an image here that shows you sort of in action in the studio would be nice to have. Because the other photo of you, I think, is also a non-artist picture. I think it was you standing in front. Right, it was like, yeah, so here yeah. you're in front of the painting, but we don't get a sense of your process. Mm -hmm. So I think I want to see that a little bit more. And the last thing I'll say is I would get rid of this blue background. Because oh, I think right. any background that is not white looks terrible. I think black is sort of OK, but black seems to like fill everything in. and then starts to look really dark, and it seems like the, the sparse white web page tends to look cleaner for a lot of artists. So get rid of the blue because it's on. Um, just use white down. Yeah, just use white. I mean, I know some people worry. They're like, oh, it's too, and I'm like, no, you want it. Because the thing is, if this was white, and this was all we had to look at, we would look at the photo. We would not be looking at this and going, oh, blue against the green, against the blue, against, you know, we don't think about that. We just go, image. That's all you want us to see. 
Okay, let's take a look at Carrie. So, Carrie, where are you? There you go. Yeah. Okay. Tell us about your website. Well, it's always changing. It's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And if you click on any of the artwork, I originally <coughs> had it set up as a grid. Mm -hmm. And then I felt like it broke, it condensed everything to square. So some paintings are horizontal, some are vertical, and it was just giving me a little section of it. So especially on your phone, I felt like somebody clicked on that initial grid page, and they were only really seeing like segments of the painting. Well, that shouldn't be the case. I mean, that's your platform. You have to figure out some setting, because some platforms, the default setting will crop the image. Right. And you have to go back in and change it to full image or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's just a technicality in your okay. web platform. Right. But um, yeah, you don't want to condense everything into this. You, you definitely want like grids. Yeah. So that way you can go through. So Although, on the front page, one image is enough. Yeah. Yeah. And you can tell a lot of us don't like these slideshows because we go, oh, slow down. I want to see. I want to just see what your work really looks like. Uh, can I make a comment? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, the way I solved that problem about things getting cropped too much is in Photoshop, you can take like a, a vertical photo and then put a background around it and you can make it into another shape. You can, but you know what's the problem is when it shows up on a Google search, yeah. it shows up as an image with white stuff on the outside, which looks really messy. And honestly, you should that's a lot of work oh, yeah. to have to do that. <laughs> I mean, you have to go into your platform and figure See, out what that is. What yeah, because yeah. there has to be some way to fix yeah. that. Okay. Um, my first impression is your main part is out of control. I know. Oh my I goodness, know. where I do know. I start? What is homes for sale? Are you a real estate broker? No, you'll see if you click on that. <laughs> What's this? We're protecting you on Wellesley. Oh, here, oh, we, here go. we go. It's, it's a promotion where okay. the part of the proceeds go to Habitat for Humanity. Oh, yeah. so. uh -huh. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> do you see how much of that I read? Yeah. None of it. None of it. Yeah, so a couple things that are um, a concern there. The first one is that homes for sale is very confusing. Yeah. My first reaction was, she's a part-time broker. Yeah. And then when I got there, I go, shelter, home, sale, price, interested, oh, I'm done, okay. goodbye. All right. That's my reaction. All right. um, okay, so installations. Okay, this is also misleading because the term installation usually refers to like a 3D sculpture which is installed somewhere. And so that's what I was excited. And then I got, wait, are you an interior designer? Like, it's very confusing. So you want to watch out for these images where it's the painting with this gigantic sofa. I think if it's a commission, just show the painting. You don't need to see it. So I probably don't even need that heading then. No, you don't need that at all. Just have it be a gallery. I mean, the only time I think a photo like this is helpful. Mm -hmm. Let's say you do have an online shop mm -hmm. and you have six images of the same painting. You have the painting, you have a couple close-ups, and you have a picture of what that painting might look like installed to show scale. Mm -hmm. This is good if you're really trying to sell, sell, yeah. but if it's just a gallery, you just want to show people or get rid of it. It's okay. too distracting. All right, so all my artwork is on your paintings on, on the heading. Okay. This is my problem. But so wait, this is, why is there option stuff in here? No, this isn't just, wait a second, this is installation, but you also have exhibitions in here? Right, so, yeah, well, it's kind of a mishmash. I was just showing paintings in situations. Yeah, but see, these are all really different situations. Yeah. Like, some of them are homes, some of them are galleries, some of them are openings, it's, it's really all over the place. Okay. Okay, guess what archive screams, you guys? I'm old, <laughs> I'm not interesting, go away. That's my first thought. Representation, what is this? Are you a gallery dealer? Well, I'm represented, so I need to be able to put her on there or else. Oh, okay, so that should go under contact. Okay. So you should do gallery, blah, 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 contact. Okay. That should not get its own tab. Okay. Um, events and exhibitions, okay, let's see. Um, this looks pretty good. A lot of scrolling, though. I would make some of these photos a little bit smaller. Yeah, this was, you know, it's a template too, so I need to. Yeah, I mean, it's hard with the templates because a lot of them are limited yeah. in terms of what you can do. But I will tell you guys. I'm gonna see if my website will pop up. I don't know why it won't do it because I paid an embarrassing amount of money for my website template, but it was really worth it because some of the other templates are terrible. Yeah. So but I like this one. Well, I didn't hire somebody to WordPress template. So WordPress has all these templates and you can buy certain ones. 
And so I have these banners at the top, and then when you come down, these are the actual bodies of work. But what I liked about the bodies of work is if you click on them, um, you can have the text at the top, and then you can make them bigger. You can go next, you can go back, and you can go back to the grid. And so I liked how seamless mm -hmm. that looked. And so that, that allowed me to create um, sort of like a tile like that. And then I'll show you guys my contact page. It really is literally <laughs> what I told you guys um, with the photo. That's pretty much all it is. And then the about page. I have a lot of video content, and so my website's a little bit different for that reason. And if you click here, you can come to my CV, which has links all over the place. So anyway, you can take a look at that later. But I think what you need to do is consolidate into very specific categories because you have everything just blending into everything else. And a lot of the terminology you're using is very misleading. Yeah. Like we're installation, representation, homes for sale? Like yeah. what is all that stuff? Okay. Let me just look at your about page. Um, well, what's your opinion of uh, like one of the images you had, you had to scroll to see the whole thing. Mm -hmm. you, you want to just on that one page and that's it without having to scroll. Yeah, I just don't like scrolling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most yeah. people Plus just don't you like it. have half the image cut off and mm -hmm. you can't see the whole thing. So exactly, it's it's hard. Um, this is an okay photo, but it's a little evasive because we can't see your face. So I think you probably should have one where at least some of your face is showing. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Work. Uh, okay, so this you don't want to do. See how this yeah. is written out? You should just embed the link here. So you guys should never on a website ever have to write out www dot blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. Just embed it okay. in there. It's, it's the same thing as writing click here. Yeah. It's like it's not yeah. necessary to do that. Um, also, when I look at this, okay, I know you're into botanical art. I know you teach at the botanical gardens. Uh, something oil you paint. Okay, I'd like to see a little bit more about your materials, mm -hmm. about your process. Like, do you work with colored pencils? Do you work with canvas? Do you work with whatever? That's in the second. I know, but look at how long this is. Do I really want to read this whole thing? You guys would be shocked at how quickly a 16-year-old goes through a website. <laughs> I mean, I did usability testing with a bunch of 16-year-olds, and I showed them, I'm not joking, a one-minute video. You know what they did? They clicked on the last three seconds and watched the lab, and I said, why did you just do that? Well, I want to know what I'm going to get at the end of the video. I can't be bothered to watch the whole minute of the video to find out what happens at the end. That's how short people's attention spans are. Who and here's what 15-year-olds say. Well, you know something though? A lot of these curators are not that old because some of these curators are 30 years old right now. Not all of them. There's a lot of curators who are 50, 60, 70, but there is a generation of younger curators. I thought you said 13. Well, I mean, the, the 25 year olds are just as bad as the 15 year olds. Like, they're just as fast, if not worse. So, what I'm saying is that. You can't assume that only people this age and up are going to be looking at your website. Maybe it is the 30-year-old curator. Maybe it's the gallery director who just got hired out of school and they're looking at your website. So you have to be prepared to address all different demographics of people. But then maybe you're talking to the 70-year-old curator who doesn't do social media. So it, it's like you have to cater to all those audiences. That's what makes this so, so tricky to do. And these are all cap. Yeah, it's all caps, which is also very hard to read. Um, I think landscapes and botanicals, I think what I would change that to is change one of those out so it's representative of the painting, like painting and botanicals, or landscapes and paintings, or just botanical paintings. Or, because here you have landscapes and botanicals, those are both subjects, mm -hmm. and they don't say anything about you as a painter. So, or you could just say visual artist, the tangles, or I don't know, just come up with a different heading that's a little bit more specific. Okay, so Claudia, let's take a look at you. So you're Claudia, right? Yes. Okay, so talk to us about your website. Well, um, I tried to, having attended the, this lecture last year, I went back and tried to fix all my mistakes, and I'm sure I still have a lot more. I tried to make it simple, although, Fluffy about statement kind of resonated with me, so. Okay, do you not have an about statement? I'm. Oh, what is this? Oh, it keeps bugging me about this. Network change. Okay, here we go. 
let's see. Okay, what I would do on your about page, you see all this stuff? Yep. Make that into a separate link that takes you to another page. So on my page, let me go back. So this is my I am a so and so and so and so. And then there's a link here to my CV, which then takes you to this. Because my CV, who wants to put this on one page? It's just so much to read. And so here, you're having to put all this information that clutters your about page. So just write CV, link it, take us to another page, and put all that stuff there. It just declutters your about page a little bit. Um, let's see. All right, this is funny. Why is this font bigger than this font? Because I love font. <laughs> yeah, that looks weird. Also, what is this white line? Is that part of the photo, or is that? No, that's probably a bug in the background. Yeah, I would fix that. This is also very out of focus. Um, so you need to get a better photo. And also, it would be really nice to have a photo where you're in your studio, or with your paints, or a painting, or something like that. I have a question, it's not just hers, mm -hmm. but it just reminded me. You're referring to yourself in the third person. Mm. Is that good or bad? I think that's a personal choice. I don't think that one is necessarily better or worse than another. I think the difference is if you write in first person, it feels a little bit friendlier. So for example, on mine, I do write it in first person. I am an adjunct professor, mm -hmm. as opposed to Clara Lou is an adjunct professor. I feel like when you write it in third person, it has a more formal feel to it. And some people are very turned off by it, especially the younger generation. They feel that it's a little bit snotty. But I don't really care. I mean, some people really do. I think it's, it's like apples and oranges. It's just like, which one do you want? So yeah. Uh, but what's weird about yours is that you switch from third to first. That I would not do. You've got to just pick one and be consistent about it. Um, let's see, let's look at your paintings, okay, view, again. okay, so you shouldn't have to tell us what to do. We will automatically start clicking. Did you notice that when we went on the main page, I just started clicking right away? I was just trying to click on stuff, so just, that's people's tendency. Okay, so here we have that. Okay, do you have, you don't have any information about the artwork though, so you probably want something that says the medium, the size, the year, the title, because especially with painting, this could be a three inch tall painting, could be a 50 foot tall painting, who knows? I mean, you can't tell. Yeah, so you need something about scale. Oh, here we go. Wait, some of them happen and some of them don't? Uh, that confused. Okay, but see how I'm happy? Yeah, see, this one doesn't have it. Yeah. Okay, so, but you see the scrolling thing? This picture is so big that to go to the next one, I have to do this to see the whole image. So that's also a little bit awkward. So you may want to make this display a little bit smaller. Let's look at your artist statement. Um, sorry, I don't know why the Walton Library does not like my laptop for some reason. <laughs> Let's see. That doesn't have a problem last week. Apparently you took too long, Claudia. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I think this is just the network. I don't <coughs> also, I think the pictures would look better if the background was white. Yes. In general, any colored background on an artist site is a problem. Just get rid of it. It just never, ever looks good. So. Even, new, even new to gray? It even always even looks bad. I, I just have never seen it and thought, oh, I love that gray. I've always thought, oh, the gray. Yeah, so. I'm not wild about white. Why not? Kind of boring. Yeah, but is the background of your website there to entertain me? Or is it there to just hold a picture? You, you have to remind yourself, what are people coming to your website to look at? <coughs> are they there to look at the color of the wall? Or are they there to look at the artwork? Okay? There's a reason why galleries have white walls, you guys. That that's not an accident. It's, it's because you are able to see the artwork a lot better. Okay, I don't know why this is not loading. Sorry, Claudia. Yeah. Let's look at Judy's and then I'll come back to yours and see if it loads at some point. Okay, so Judy, talk to us about yours. Well, you chose portfolios and that's the only part of mine that really is oh. ready for prime time. So what <laughs> happens if I just go to Judy Brown Photography? Is it the same site or is oh, it? Oh, I think I, oh, no, you should be at home, home, I think. I mean, your own portfolios, which is the best place to be, but... Yeah, but uh, how come... Well, if you click home, see what happens. Nothing happens. That's strange. Anyway, we'll, we'll take a look at this. 
Okay, so Judy, talk to us about this. Um, okay, well these are, the, and the, let me just say the rest of it is old stuff that I did ages ago and I can't bring myself to get rid of it. But the portfolios are portfolios, that is they're photographs that are ready to be seen or have been seen or whatever. Okay, so we click and on these? I've got a, I think okay. I have an overall artist statement at the top left. Actually, no, you should see home because because I had um, a hot shot portfolio review about six years ago and uh, she said <coughs> you should show, um, you should show uh, an exhibit on your, on your front page that that shows people that they're collectibles. So I redid everything. I spent God knows, God knows how long. If you just had judyjohnphotography.com, it really should go to home rather than portfolios. That's weird. I, I want to stay on this page, though, because the network has been so glitchy. Okay. I don't want to well, go yeah. away and lose your website entirely. Um, do you know why this is showing up? These like edit, image, 7582? Oh, because I'm too, so lazy that I have to put uh, names on everything. Yeah, you've got to fix that like ASAP, because that looks really bad. It's, it looks so sloppy to not have the actual images, okay, not the actual titles. Yeah. So you gotta get rid of that. It takes a lot of time. Uh, well, yeah, your, websites your, take a lot of time. Your photos look so nice though, and then they have... It, it, it takes away from your photo, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, it's just really... Um, I think you need to curate. You have so much content here. No, I, that, that's what I said. I mean, yeah. you must, you've gotten off of a portfolio somehow. Um, okay. Um, like I say, the rest uh, are not. Uh, yeah, I'm just so confused about the navigation. Like I don't know where. Well, I don't. I've never seen it not. Uh, at least you know, click over on the left and. Okay. Okay. I would not put your um, your CV as a PDF because the only reason you ever really need it as a PDF is so someone can download it. And no offense, most people don't really need to download your PDF <laughs> CV. So. Okay, but that popped up. You didn't yeah, I just think that it. it's better to put your CV like this because then you can put links and stuff into it. But oh. if it's a PDF, you can't do that. So um, I would change that. Let's look at your contact page. Okay, can you grab your email address? Okay, so the thing is, you don't have any of your um, Instagram or anything here. Also, why does this come up? I think I up? do have, I'm not sure if I do have. I think I have Instagram. This is a smug mug thing that I have, you know, you can have your own, you can have, have a template and then adapt it if you have a month to spend. And oh, and then I did at one I point. I see. Okay, now you clicked there on an external link that went yeah. to my Wellesley page. Okay, um, this is Yeah, oh, right. Um, okay, but this is your personal profile. That's no, that's Facebook. That that little F yeah, is, yeah. Mm -hmm. is uh, Smug Mugs. So this is Smug, Smug Mug, Mug, which is part of the Wellesley. Network? No, nothing to do with Wellesley. Smug Mug is one of the sites where I mean, one of the places where you can, for I don't know what, for seventy five dollars a year or something like that. Oh, uh, I mean, I find this sweet. impossible to navigate. Like, I don't know where to go. So. My recommendation is to start from scratch and start with something like Squarespace and just clean, lean. You've got to cut back on your website like 80%. Like you just have so much content that Not it's hard to stay in portfolios. Which yeah, but see, that's hard for me to have to know to stay in portfolios. You know, like, am I going to be there to say, stay in portfolios, don't go to that messy place? You know, you can't make it so that it's hard for your um, user to know where to go because I'm so confused about where I'm supposed to be. So, because I've, I've seen your, like this is a great Oh, book. okay, that's, like, that should be the first, that should be home. Okay. Home should show that, the, according to Mary Kinder Swanson, that they're collectibles. Then you come to portfolios, and those each and every one is a set of like maybe 20, something like that, photographs that either have been shown or should God's ever grace me. Um, so the main it. page with that really nice like exhibition That's photo, home. that looks great. That looks really good. But once I get here, I get really overwhelmed and don't know where to click. So you, you got to <laughs> cut it back way, way, way back. You got too much stuff on your website. I would say it's hard. It's really hard. Less is more. It really is. 
All right, we're almost out of time. I'm going to go back to Claudia's for a second and just see if it um, wants to cooperate with me or not. Oh, I don't know what's up with this network. Okay, sorry. Let's do a couple of questions. Who's got questions about things? Over here. Um, you were having links to, for instance, your, your ink on your, your website. Did that just take you to the general Amazon, or did it take you to Amazon Inc.? It, no, it <laughs> takes you to that, well, in my particular context, it takes you to that particular um, item. So if somebody wants to buy a four ounce bottle of Higgins India okay. Inc., it will take them right there. So that's, that's a better way to do a link, is the more specific the link is, the better. Like general Amazon doesn't help anybody. Yeah. Okay. You don't have time to look at another one, do you? Hmm? I don't. I'm sorry. We're almost out of time. I just want to make sure we have time for questions. Are blogs important? No. They're only important oh, if you are a very good writer yeah. and you write all the time and can post at least three or four times a week about a topic which is very specific that you are an expert on. If you don't have that, don't bother. Okay. Blogs are not important for artists. Instagram is way more important oh. than having a blog. Thank you. You had a shop on your website. Did you say that links you to Etsy, or are you shopping? Oh, here, I'll show you on the back. So it goes to shop. Yeah. So if you click here, this will then take you to my Etsy shop. So in my website, I separate between here's where you're shopping and here's where you're looking. Mm -hmm. Because to me, it's two totally different things. Because if you go through here, you can find out about shipping, you know about my policies, you know the amount, I'll tell you how big the piece is, where I made it, you get everything. Uh -huh. Whereas if you look at just my actual galleries, you're not gonna get any of that kind of information. You're just gonna look at the artwork. You're not gonna be like, oh, well, well, not for this piece necessarily, but you're not gonna go, oh, this one ships for $23 Canadian in, um, you know, international shipping, 18 days, you're not going to get that information here. Mm -hmm. But you will get it in my Etsy shop. Mm -hmm. So it's up to you. Some people really want their website to be their shop. Right. Other people want them separate. It right. depends. Right. So if somebody looks and says, I love that, I want to buy it, mm -hmm. how do they go to Etsy and find, how does that linkage happen? Well, what you can do is you can just scroll, literally, you can just do that. But also Etsy has categories. So you can go in here and you can say, okay, small ink drawings. Okay, charcoal drawings. I mean, Etsy has the cold grid thing, so in theory, you could just go through all of these categories and just scan really fast, or you can just go, I don't want to bother with that. Oh, contact Clara. Okay, boom, send an email. Where do I find this piece? I love it. Boom, that's it. Would you mentioned embedding a, like a buy it now button. Would that I ever don't... be able to take you to Etsy? I mean, you could. You, you certainly could uh, find the individual Etsy listing, embed the link, and say buy it now. It's just my priority as an artist has never been selling. Like priority, my priority has always been showing. The selling is like the last thing I think about. So I'm not a very good example for somebody who does that. But you can. You absolutely could do it that way if you wanted to. I when have found. Oh, sorry. I'm back there. Oh, okay. Okay. When you have Clara at ClaraLoo.com, can someone just Click on that and get to it. This is what should happen. You want to set it up like this. So that when somebody clicks on that, just boom, it just pops up this email. And so now I can just type. Oh, even without the ampersand, it'll do that? Yeah, because it's an oh, embedded it's link. link. Yeah, oh. it's a link. It's not just that. <laughs> so what you would do, the tag is mail to colon clara at claralu.com. That is what I embedded in that link to create an, an so it opens an instantaneous email. Because it drives me crazy when I have to like cut and paste somebody's email address. It's so much better if you just click and it just opens a mail message. It's much better. You're trying to make things as easy as possible for people so that they <coughs> have to do nothing to get what they need. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like there are two different types of sites. There's one that is a shop where mm -hmm. people go and purchase. And then there's one that feels more like a gallery. Yep. Do you find that if you are represented at all in any galleries, that they look at scans at the fact that you have a, a shop? I mean, you need to talk to your gallery about that. Because there are some gallery deals where they say, we own you, and you cannot sell anything right. without our permission. Other artists will say, well, we own this part of you, but you can sell this. So you've got to talk to your gallery about yeah. that. So yeah, but you've you got to be careful. You can get in trouble for that. Yeah. Do you separate out 
personally, like stuff that you're showing in a gallery with stuff that you have You mean in my Etsy shop? Yeah. yeah well, my Etsy shop, I, I refer to it as my personal yard sale mm -hmm. because my big <laughs> artwork is not never in my Etsy right. shop. It's always like the leftovers. Okay. It's like those little gesture warms I did the other day at Life Drawing and I just popped them into my Etsy shop. Mm -hmm. So you won't find anything in my Etsy shop that actually goes in like a show, like okay. a gallery show. It won't be in there. Or you'll find stuff that's like 10 years old, like so old that like it's not as relevant anymore. So I'm not really somebody who focuses on selling. I just sell this stuff because I'm like, you know what? This will probably be sitting at the bottom of the closet. It might as well be on Etsy. Mm -hmm. And I do make a couple sales each month with pretty much no effort at all. So it's for me worth it, but it really depends on your mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, some people are much more aggressive about it, and maybe I could make way more if I actually tried harder, but it's just not a priority for me right now. Mm -hmm. You mail them yourself? Yeah, it's, it's not difficult because PayPal is embedded into the whole Etsy thing, so you can do ship now and you, it's so easy. Like you just, once you've done it, you're like, I cannot believe how easy this is. It's incredible the way they put it together. Has Etsy really dealt with the, um, collecting sales tax issue? They do not, which I am someone shocked Someone told by. me that they did. It's no, they, they, it's really like honor system. I mean, I do it because I'm uptight about stuff like that, but so many people do not pay sales tax on Etsy, so yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Do they do the package for you? You mean actually shipping it? Yeah. Oh no, I do it myself. So what I do is I take the work, I mail it, I print out the shipping label, I put the shipping label on, drop it off the post office, done. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly fast. Once you get a system down in place, it's not difficult. <laughs> and I buy all my packing stuff in advance in bulk, so I'll buy like 30 tubes, and I have to buy any tubes for like two years mm -hmm. because it drove me nuts. Like every time I got an order, I had to drive staples, get the tube cut in. Now I just pop it out of my garage and it's right there. Mm -hmm. So you gotta set up a system that works. Okay, thank you very much. If you guys can take two seconds to fill out that form, I think um, Sally has a library, just wants it to get a little bit of feedback about programs like this. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to do that and for coming. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.